Okay. I'll give you like 45 the whole 50, 60 seconds if you want. Everybody, if I can just have you guys in attention, please. I just want to let you guys know my mixtape is dropping soon. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. Hi, everybody. My name is Tyler Bass, and I'm here with a program called GIG. And we're looking for students like you guys to volunteer on some awesome adventures. What's in it called? GIG. G I V E. GIG. Yes, sir. Could be more. You get a lot more people if you get a tape. Low key, honestly. We'll call it you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we're looking for students like you guys to volunteer some awesome adventures in places like Tanzania, Nicaragua, Thailand, Laos, Nepal, and Hawaii while receiving academic credit. With Gibbs, you'll travel to remote villages to build schools, teach kids English, and protect endangered species, while at the same time, check through the jungles of Asia, climb Mount Kilimanjaro, feed elephants, swim at dolphins, and so much more. We're having meetings all day today, so there's lots of green flyers. You guys can just take them. Um, and at the end of class, our student group is going to come back and collect them. You guys can also visit our website at givevolunteers.org. Thank you guys so much for your time. The world is just so much bigger than the four corners of our daily environment. So I really can't wait to see you guys at our meeting and can't wait to see you guys overseas as well. Thank you. Where, where's the handouts? They have them. Oh, there we go. Let's look on the table. Yeah. Well, Magic, you, you know? You can give me one. <laughs> Would you like Well, I'm kind of retired. I might get ready to go here with you. Yeah, know. you definitely should, honestly. It's I'll a lot of fun. I'll make the one in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> you should. That's our newest program. You got it. Have a good day, guys. Thank you. Yeah. It was Tyler. Okay. Um, that is actually is, is kind of a little speech as that was um there are, i will encourage you not necessarily that that's up to you i mean you can take your own decisions there uh, but there are engineers without borders um and they do travel and uh, they do a lot of kind of what we're doing uh, in lab they uh they kind of they find a remote place for somehow i don't know how it works every time but they find like a remote place to do some mapping and then start to build or maybe to go through the process of building like a small water treatment plant or a small sewage treatment plant or a small school or something like that. So they actually go through pretty much a full process, pretty much in real, you know, it is real. They actually build it. So uh, uh, they spend a little bit of time there. Pretty well resourced, very well organized. Um, I, I've always heard good things of folks that have come back from it. Kind of like a Peace Corps, but not, or an AmeriCorps, but not. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. The one thing that he said was really cool. The world bigger than your little four corners, and it's a whole lot bigger than you know Cincinnati to Dayton to Northern Kentucky. Um, I did not travel when I was young, um, and I kind of wish I had. 
kind of wish I'd have taken that opportunity. Um, you know, life's busy, school's important, and you got all those things. Uh, but life starts to happen to you pretty fast when you get, you know, kind of out there and stuff. And then you kind of look back and, you know, all of a sudden you blink twice and it's 20, 30, 40 years later. You kind of start looking back and I'm like, oh, I wish I had done that. So, uh, you know, now I'm a little too old, too crafty and all that stuff. I probably won't, but I, I probably should have probably, probably would have done well to take, uh, take some journeys and adventures and you know, those kinds of things, that kind of stuff. It, it always lends itself pretty good, pretty well. So I encourage you to think about that pretty strongly, actually. Okay. And the other thing I want you to think about pretty strongly is photography. Because that's what we're doing today. Um, I am recording this live and on YouTube instead of the private link, which sometimes is an issue. Um, I had a couple of people ask me, did I record it? And I did, but I have to now set up the private link and send you an email, blah, blah, blah. So I think we're just going to go live and in person here and see how this works today. Um, Got to throw all my dirty laundry on YouTube, right? It is what it is. All right. Uh, calculator, you'll need that. Maybe a piece of paper, you'll need that. Kind of a focused set of eyeballs and thought process. To uh, try to work with me to make this picture. Spaced it too far. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, people, you experienced this. This is you. You did this. Uh, Thursday's group, you're going to do this today. We're going to do this this afternoon. Um, again, what I want to try to get out of I think a, a good learning outcome is for you to be able to make a, a diagram, a sketch of what you've experienced and try to make a good one. Right? And I use a straight edge each kind of a thing and you know kind of roughly stuff like that. So we're gonna set up an A, or you've already set up an A, these are Wednesday people. And we set up a total station and we had a measurement with a little ruler, a stick or whatever. It measured 4.8 feet. 4.8 feet. <clears throat> Somebody took the rod and measured the height of the rod. It was five and a half, 5.5 feet. And somebody stood over it, benchmark uh, GPS, GPS one. Now, for today's learning exercise, I'm calling it 750. We know that it's something different, um, but I, I, I want to teach you the, the process rather than the particular. So the rod was at five and a half. So we took a shot, took the measurement, zero set, all those kinds of good things that we do, take a distance, and the vertical difference is negative, 3.75. That means that the glass, the prism, 
was 3.75 feet lower than the total station, or the center of the optics of the total station. Person takes the rod then and walks over to point B, gives us a shot, gives us a measurement. Now I'm just putting up the vertical stuff. So uh, that says 1.9. I didn't do a very good job on that. Let's make that a little bit clearer. That's a plus 1.9. Well, 190, 1.90, and I think if you think, I think if you think a little bit for a minute or two, you can tell me what the elevation of point B is. Now, I'm not going to do this for you. I'm going to let you think. <coughs> Or check with your neighbor or something. I don't care. I don't mind if you work in two, three. Okay. Three. Take a look at the diagram. Yes. Never got the same answer you did. So if you're using the 4.8, it doesn't mean anything. Why not? But you measured it and you got a number up there, George. You got to use it. Everything is messy. But everything has meaning. How'd you get it then? Well, this is what you should be asking your neighbor, especially if they got it right. We took our benchmark. I added 5.5 for the rod. Just me to the glass. Now, I'm working sort of backwards here. So I started at my known elevation. You got to start at your known elevation. So if if the glass is 375 feet lower than the total station, the total station is 3.75 feet higher than the glass. Kind of profound, but not really. When you're taking the measurement, it's 375 feet lower. 
glass is 3.75 feet lower than the total station, you could go backwards and say that the total station is 3.75 feet higher than the glass. So you have to add 3.75. That gives us the elevation of the optic. I didn't solve that intermediately. I could have. I could have stopped right there and got that number, but I kept on going. Then, now I'm here going the other direction. And so the glass at point B is 1.90 higher than the instrument. And now I subtract 5.5. <coughs> get the 755.65. So what about the 4.8? 4.8 only buys us one elevation point. It only buys us one thing, one time. And I could have <coughs> done this if I wanted to know the elevation of A. If I were to ask for the elevation of A, you do essentially the same thing, 750 plus the 5.5, plus the 3.75, and then I can subtract 4.8 to get the elevation of point A. So if I wanted to know the elevation of point A, it is, in this case, 754.45. I guess the purest at heart would go 754.45 and then plus 4.8 keep on their journey. If I go down and then back up, okay, you can do that too. Um, but that, that 4.8 really only buys us one elevation point, um, and that's the elevation point A. Ask your neighbor if that makes sense to them. And if it doesn't, raise your hand, and I can explain it to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know? <laughs> 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 You got a sponge pilot. Thank you. Give and take. All right. Seriously, yeah, I'm kind of screwing around here. It's almost, I'm off tomorrow. It's like Friday. Anybody not understand that? Everybody gets that. Everybody gets that. Let me answer. Help me. Help me. Let me help you. What's missing? I don't know. So, I want to know what's missing. So I had the rod here, so we add that. That's the height of that, so I guess it's the glass. 375 more. Oh, it's well, like X and Y axis. 375 more gets us to the gets us to the by the way, they call this a datum. It's a big fancy word I haven't used. I'll talk about that maybe maybe today. There's nothing more than like a big axis. So zero way down here. We're 750 feet in elevation. And all we're doing is adding them on a number line. So 750 plus five and a half plus 375 gets me to here. And then another 190 gets me to the glass at this one. But then I got to come back down. I got to come back down to get the elevation there. All right. You kind of study that a little bit, and I think it'll come together. But then all you're doing is adding and subtracting up and down. All right. And if not, I'll check with you on check with you a little bit later on. See if I can help. Now, that's good. That's great. But I gave you the picture. Let's try this. I'm gonna turn my paper the other way so I can write words up.
Okay, a little messy, I apologize. I'm an engineer, EMG stands for engineering, not English. So if I write this thing out in word form, all of a sudden your brain goes crazy. No, you don't have a picture on the left side of your logical thinking brain. You got yourself words and you're reading the paragraph on the right side of your brain and you make these one fuzzy. This is why we hate word problems. It's why y'all hate word problems. Most of us hate word problems. Because the problem is not in the problem. The problem is in words and your math is just conflicting with your reading. But it's the same problem. It says the total station is set up at A. Um, it is 4.8. They call that little hi, height of instrument. It has a, a height of instrument, or it is 4.8 feet above a, above point A. A backside is taken to GPS 1, and the vertical distance reads negative 3.75. A shot is taken to B. His vertical distance is plus 1.90. If the rod is set to 5.5 constant, what is the elevation of B? What is the elevation of A? So it's exactly the same problem, but most of the time the problem, you eat this up, almost all of these ate this up without too much conflict. Yeah, a little bit. I just haven't been out there on Thursday yet, or you know, maybe it's not quite together, but for the most part, you eat this up. That's all you're doing is adding and subtracting. And I gave you a picture. It's to scale, or at least it's in the, you know, I kind of got the I got the rod here lower than what it is. I got the rod here higher than what it is. It's it's pretty much to scale. And you kind of chewed it up and gave me a pretty good answer. I will tell you that if I were to do that to you, even if I typed it up, it was me, I'd get probably half as many getting the right answer. <clears throat> probably half of it. And I bet, again, I've been doing this a long time. I just know what the results are. So the problem isn't the topography. The problem is making a decent sketch out of Envisioning what you're doing, what does that mean to set up? What is an HI? What is the rod? And I taking that vision, taking that and making a sketch out of it so that you can, you can get the right answer. The other thing that you can do, and I see this typically on this problem, is I'll get something like this. So we'll kind of make a sketch and we'll do this, we'll do this, and we'll do this, or they'll do this, and we'll do this, and they'll do this. And we'll do this, and we got an A, and I got a B, and a G. Oh, this is A, no, this is GPS 1. And I get all kinds of little screwy little pictures of people not really understanding the problem. You understand the problem, what you don't understand is being able to take the words and make it into a picture. And that's kind of my, my first lesson for today. So let's go back to um, plan view for a minute. Zoom out again. Because there's actually two parts to what we did yesterday or 
Tuesday, we took shots at different points. Man, we went to the curb line, we went to the light pole, um, up by Stonehands, we took shots at the trees. We took 15, 20 shots. I don't know. Something in that ballpark. All right, so we are now getting real close to coming inside and actually doing some mapping with this. And that's what this is all about. Doing a little bit of mapping of our stuff. So, what do we do? Well, what we're going to do, again, I'm going to make this relatively to scale, like I'm at north kind of sort of up. I like that. Most folks like north kind of up. Just because it feels right. Man, if I turn north this way, or even that way, Lord help us this way. Your body goes crazy. So if I do something like this, it's like, okay, so we were at A, and GPS 1 was over here. Benchmark UC was sort of over here. Brookline was sort of like it here. I'm kind of hand drawing them out. Kind of just drawing something, not to scale, but just roughly in my head. So I'm just going to take these two points for the moment and disconnect them. Let's say the shot was taken. Um, <coughs> Let's go to Stonehenge here. Let's, let's pretend that we're going to take a shot to Stonehenge. Whatever the thing is called. So when, when we look at our numbers, we would have had a, a horizontal distance maybe, or maybe a horizontal angle of, um, let's say it's about 115 degrees. And I'm just going to keep it in whole numbers for right now. Um, Let's say it was about 84 feet. So our horizontal angle to the right, we had a horizontal distance. Um, our vertical distance was maybe a plus uh, 3.7 and would have had an elevation. Okay. I have to get to this again. We, we, we started that process here. That's really what this is. So let's suppose we've gone through that process and the elevation is uh, 759. Again, I'm just kind of keeping some basic numbers here for demo, uh, demonstration purposes. By the way, this is in Canvas, a little bit better form um, under the resources or the lab manual or whatever it's called. So you can see it a little bit better form. But I just want to explain. So, last time I gave you this highly valuable piece of equipment called a protractor. Um, let me move it out of the way and see if I can zoom in just real quick. Because now, it's kind of time to talk about this. If you didn't get one, I've got a few more up here on the podium. I don't know if the light on or the light off is helpful. Let's see what happens. That's not bad. That's better. I don't hate it. Sometimes if I hold it down, I get rid of it. Ain't bad. We'll go with it. Freeze. Okay, so I gave you this little protractor. Yeah, I know, it's just a little piece of plastic that I, I didn't even cut it out. You can take it with scissors and sort of cut the thing out and trim it up. This is a really good piece of tool. Uh, most protractors do not read like this one. This is a civil engineering protractor, one that I gave you. It's why I gave it to you. They're kind of hard to find. Um, this brand is called an Alvin P260. There's a Helix 260, um, but it, it, it just, there's only a couple of them that read this way. And this is civil engineering surveying protractors. 99% of them read like AutoCAD or math where you got you know, zero this way, you usually get a half a circle and it kind of reads counterclockwise, counterclockwise or clockwise, you know, sometimes both ways. You can use them, but you got to ignore the numbers and just count. 
I like this one because it's in our face what we need. So let me explain. Notice that this, uh, uh, the inner scale goes zero to 360 in a clockwise fashion. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 90, 100, 180, 192, 250, 270, 310, 20, all the way back to 360. So it reads clockwise. That's exactly what those instruments were doing. When we set the instrument up, we take a backside, it reads a clockwise angle to where we're going. Great. Love that. The other scale, the outer scale, are bearings. We started bearings the other day. I didn't go crazy with them yet, uh, but, you know, we started to talk about bearings. And we said that a bearing is 0 to 90, 0 to 90, or from the south, southeast, 0 to 90, or from the southwest, 0 to 90. So it is a bearing and a instrument clockwise. Uh, 0 to 360 turn. So this is a nice little piece of equipment. You can buy one for about, I don't know, five, six bucks. I think they were at the bookstore. They used to be, maybe not. But don't buy anything unless it's this. Otherwise, you're just kind of wasting your time and money. Go to Amazon and have it sent to you in three days or whatever. Uh, but if you want a nice piece of, just kind of a nice tool to keep with you, especially if you're at CM, this is kind of handy uh, because you can then take these things and put them on a map. Kind of read the angle, get a get a feel of what you're actually building. You know, most of the things are 90, but the property lines won't be 90. Or maybe they won't be 90 anymore. Nothing's, nothing's square, right? Like it's a little salty. So you can start, you can kind of use this for that purpose. Anyway, we're here. I'm going to zoom back out. So for here, we want to replicate what we did in the lab. So if I hold zero point here, this is where I set up at, and then I want to put zero 360 aimed at my backside. That's what it means to take a backside and zero set. Literally, when you hit that button zero or zero set on the instrument, it is zeroing out the backside. It's zeroing out that backside where you came from. So then we could turn 115 degrees. So now it's just simply looking at the numbers. Here's 100, 110, 115. I can put a little dot right here. So I'm at 115 degrees. And then if you go and invest another three bucks in the scale, and this is not one I didn't put five months, but, it's four months. but you'll notice there's an engineer scale and an architect scale. You don't want the architect scale because we ain't one. We're engineers and surveyors. So you want to go get the engineer scale. It generally says the word engineer on there. But we're not talking quarter scale, half, eighth, you know, an eighth of an inch equals a foot, quarter inch. That's all architecture stuff. If they got one, you can buy it, but make sure you also buy the engineer scale. All right, so then we want to go out that distance. Now, this happens to be one inch equals 20. <laughs> which is a pretty common scale. This happens to be one inch equals 20 feet, which is a pretty common scale. Now, I got a little issue here. It falls off the paper. Because I'm only going, I have to go out 84 feet, and all I've left myself on this piece of paper was about 40. I kind of run out of room and there were somewhere around 40 feet here. Right, what do we do? Right, can you start over or I know this looks a little hokey, but I'll tell you what, you can really learn stuff by doing hokey stuff. So I got to zoom out there again. I apologize for all this zoomery. <coughs> but now, if I go out and go at at the 115 degree angle, right there is my little tick mark, my little dot that I had at 115 degrees. I can then go out 84 feet. I put a little dot right there. In fact, I'm probably going to put a little X right here. And that's 759. <coughs> and it was the Stonehenge. Right. So what I've done there is to map that point. I've mapped it to scale. Can, <clears throat> next week, if things start to roll out, we're going to do this in AutoCAD. Yeah, Cube is in AutoCAD. It's electronic. But it's exactly the same thing. 
It's exactly the same thing. And what we did um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're going to do it today on Thursday, we took a bunch of shots. We took several of these. We didn't just take one. We had like 15 of them, right? right? So we had like 15 measurements. So at the end of the day, what we had, if we were to continue, repeat that process, well, we might have a whole bunch of little X's. So if we were to continue that process of angle, distance, angle, distance, and then write down the elevation, and again, if I, we would have gotten the elevation by doing this. This is how we got the elevation. And if we only had one setup, guess what? If the rod was at the same all the time, all we got to do is change that vertical distance on each shot. Okay, you got 15 of them, but really all of these other numbers stayed the same if they're all from point A. If everything was measured from point A, all that other stuff was constant. The instrument didn't move. It was stationary. The rod moved, but even its height was kept at a constant. So, you know, we might go over here to the, might go, uh, might go up hill to the tree, it may have gone down to the curve, whatever. Your vertical distance was going to change on that shot. So each one of those measurements, each one of those shots would have changed. Each one of those verticals would have been different. But everything else is the same. So you get the elevation of all of those 15 and 20 points, and then you take an angle and a distance and plot. I mean, again, in AutoCAD, we're going to do it somewhat manually. We're going to put little X's there. But I'll tell you what, it's just as almost as fast and for what we're doing, probably about as accurate to actually put this little scale and protractor. So I'm just going to put A back over here, GPS 1 down here. <coughs> Just so that you're reoriented to what we have. So we set it in, we take a back sight to GPS 1, and then we took these shots, these measurements, all over the place. Now, Thursday's group may not fully understand that. Tuesday, Wednesday, this should be like your board. All right, now, next process. This is the part that I will tell you some students get lost in. So it's like, okay, better focus for a few minutes. The process is to generate the contours. <clears throat> in fact, on the first part of your lab, I'd like you to do pretty much what I just did right there. I don't care if you generate these with AutoCAD or you generate them with a piece of paper and a, and a, and a ruler and a scale. But I'd like you to plot out these points. Preferably to about one inch equal to one inch deep. Print them out. So once they're all printed out manually, AutoCAD, or in AutoCAD, you get this. You got all these little X's, you got these elevations. We'll just text these on. You know, we're just going to text them on in AutoCAD anyway. It, it's not a, there are software packages that cost about 10 times as much as AutoCAD to do this for you. But if you don't understand, that it's meaningless. So, this is an academic process, not a production job. I want you to understand what the heck's going on, whether you push a couple of buttons in Civil 3D or whether you do it manually. <clears throat> so what we want to do is generate the contours. The contour is a line of equal elevation. If it were to flood the elevation, let's say 750, that's a pretty high flood, I suppose. But if it were to flood elevation 750, why all this would be underwater somewhere in here. I don't know what A was over there. 54 or something. <clears throat> so um, elevation A, it would flood somewhere a little bit lower on the hill than, and we'll go right to that point. And then I don't know what it does. It comes back around or goes this way or something, blah, blah, blah. So this would be dry. This would be underwater. 
So the edge of the water at a flood zone, the edge of the ocean is at zero. The water of a lake all forms a contour. It's a line of equal elevation. So as we stand there and sort of envision Stonehenge up on the hill, it was like, okay, Stonehenge was sort of on the hill. It sort of sloped a little bit towards that great big oak tree. And then it dropped pretty, pretty steep down to the brook line, down to the curve. And then it sort of flattened out or leveled out as you go across the street. And then it sort of went down to the golf, this golf, it sort of dropped down. Well, that undulation is what we're trying to define. It's a big deal. Because when we get into cut and fill, you try to figure out how much, what elevation do we set the building? So that if I dig the dirt here and fill it over here, I get a nice level site. This becomes critical uh, to what we're doing. So we need to draw or get the contours. <clears throat> there are multiple ways to do this. In reality, this is good for small scale stuff. It's not good for big scale stuff. And I'll explain that probably next week. I just wanted to show you this process while I got the time. So a contour is a line of equal elevation. Well, how do you come up with it? So you come up with it with a process called interpolation. And you probably have done something like that in mathematics or maybe in some of your other engineering classes. Occasionally they do that stuff. If you're reading charts or something, you interpolate numbers. Now, remember, I use a scale here of 1 inch equals 20. You can actually use any scale you want, and you get exactly the same answer, no matter what this map was drawn to, but that's another topic. Most people like to use the scale that it's at, and I get that. Okay, so let's take a look. As we look at these points, we can kind of see a pattern. Looks like it's sort of dropping this way. Come back up the hill just a little bit here. Pretty steep up the hill here. Pretty much like what it was in reality over in the yard. Our first step is to actually connect these points with what's called a TIN. The TIN stands for triangular irregular Network. So, first part of the process is to create what's called a TIN, triangular irregular network. See if you take the first letter of each of those words, these are acronyms called TIN. Okay. There is one called TIN, but I just made that up a lie. So, what you do is you interconnect these. Now, there is a there are algorithms, there are some things that work and don't work, and I will explain those in more detail next class. But for right now, all we are doing is to create this 10. Right ways, there's wrong ways, there's some things that happen. <clears throat> okay. There's more to this story than just this. In fact, it's a pretty important story. But right now, you're just learning this. So just interconnect the points with a, a line. Usually it's a light line, you don't get too crazy with it. But you'll notice that it forms three, you know, any three points make a triangle, duh. And what this is is a surface, a flat, not level, but it is planar. In other words, it's it's literally a piece of plywood or cardboard. We're not going to be able to hold this as well as I'd like to. But it's literally a plane that this point is at that elevation, this point is at this elevation, this point is at this elevation. So it is it is planar, flat in between there, like a piece of plywood. Okay. It's the only data we have to make what's called the model. Whether you're using a bazillion dollar computer or a three cent piece of plastic, it's the same thing. You are making a site model. You are making the ground model, the elevation model. In fact, they will often call this the DEM. 
which stands for digital elevation model. So if it's done electronically, there's the DEM. Now, how does it do this? Well, a computer does it in about, you know, nanoseconds. It's going to take us a couple minutes here to figure this out. But it's all the same. Okay, so the second step then is we have to decide what contour interval to use. In engineering, we generally use, particularly at this level, we generally use two foot contour interval. So what that means is we're going to define the 740, 742, 744, 746, 748, 750, 52, 54, 56, 58. All of the even numbers. We're going to find the contours that are even numbers. It's probably 90% of the time in engineering, we just use the even two foot contours, all even numbers. Now, please understand, this is a, a, a point that people miss. We are not going to go from here and start going 743, 745, 747. That's not what we're finding. We are finding we're 740, 42, 44, 46, 48, 50, 52, 54, 56, 58. It's just the even numbers that we've decided to use. We could do one foot contour intervals, each one, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. The problem with that is you get a whole bunch of them and it gets real busy. It's, it's too much. We could do a half a foot contour interval. No, it's crazy. We could do a five foot contour interval. 740, 45, 50, 55, 60. The problem with that is now five feet of dirt is a whole lot of dirt. You missed by a little bit. That's a boat. That's a lot. So we need more detail. We need to get closer in precision, but not too crazy close. So ones, a lot of time, most of the time, twos for what we're doing. So we did that. I picked it. We're done. Third step then is to go through this process of interpolation. Um, and it's truly the process. So um, literally what we're doing is rise over run. So we, we simply say that slope is rise over run. That's not very profound. Anybody, we know that. Now remember, this is planar. So between any two points, I've got a constant slope. Between any two points, I have a constant slope. It's not the same slope here as there as there, but it is constant. We assume a constant slope between any two points. We assume the slope is constant between the, any two points. And it's going to be different for every point or every two points, but we assume it constant in between there. I'm going to pick this one to start out with. You can pick anyone. Now, we're not even going to really determine the slope. I, I mean, I'm not going to calculate it. It's not necessary. So um, let's write this down. Again, not real profound, but rise over run equals rise over run. This is really the equation of the set of words you like now. Okay. So the difference in elevation is the rise. The delta elevation is the rise. So 759 minus 750 is how much it rises between those two points. Change in elevation. Rise is 90. <coughs> the run has to be scaled or measured. This is the part people miss. Okay, so I'm going to scale it. In fact, I'm going to let you scale it. What is the distance between those two points? What's the scale distance? Shout out the number. 3.7. 3.7? You know, not incorrect. Some people would say 37. What you can't do is try to divide that by some inches or some 20 or something else. All right, 3.7 works fine. 
because again, you can use any scale you want. Since I called this 20 scale, a lot of people can't read a scale or don't read scales. So on an engineer scale, this represents 10 feet. That represents 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet, 80 feet, 90 feet, 100. So it's already there in your face. So a scale is already scaled out. Okay. Technically, what this means is that this represents one inch, one physical inch. If I were to get a tape measure and rule, or a ruler, that would mean one inch. But in scale world, we don't care. That means nothing. We don't care. So we could read it as 3.7. Or we could read it as 37, or some of you are seeing 38, or whatever precision you want to try to make your eyeballs. I wouldn't get too crazy with it. All right? Some of you see 37, some see 38, some see 3.7, 3.8. I'm going to use 37 because that's what I'm seeing. So the run is 37. You've got to scale that distance or measure it. That's the part that a lot of people miss when they do this. You set this up as a ratio. Now, I always work off of the high side. It's, you'll see why in just a minute. I'm always working backwards. Now, in between here, I'm going to hit seven. Well, 750 goes exactly through that point. 752 is going to be maybe here. 754 is going to be somewhere in here, 56 maybe here, 58 is going to be like right there, and then 59. So in this one, I've got a bunch of contour lines that come between it. Somewhere in here, I'm going to hit 52, 54, 56, 58, and then 59. So 759, I like to work off the high side. And I'm going to put this in parentheses. The next contour down is the 758 contour. The next one down is 758. That's the one that I'm looking for. And I'm gonna put that as over X. Oh my gosh, I'll give you a, a variable and then you're ready to put. That's good, I'm fine with that. So nine over 37 is gonna be equal to one over X, cross multiply, 37 divided nine. Anytime I got a fraction equal to a fraction, I cross multiply. So one times 37 divided by nine, X equals 4.11. Now, we don't need too many decimal places here. <coughs> All I did was solve for X in that little basic equation. You have to be able to do that. So I come down here 4.14, <coughs> and I just put a little tick mark right there. All I did is scale back from zero. I'll leave that up there. All I did was scale back from zero about 4, 4.1. And I put a little tick mark. The next contour I hit is seven. Let's see, that's 758. The next contour I'm going to hit is 56. So everything stays the same. Except now I'm looking for 756. So I still have 9 over 37, but now this becomes a 3 over x. 3 times 37 divided by 9 is a 12. 12.3. So I keep 0 here. Keep 0 here. And I come down 12. And that's where contour 56 is going to be. Now, some of you really smart folks are already ahead of me and say, well, won't you hit a constant? But it's not the first one. I hit a constant, but it's not the first one. I'd actually have to either measure this or go through the numbers. So I need to use the math and keep this process up. But the next one is then going to be a 5, and I can keep this process up. Or some of you who like shortcuts, and this is the shortcut to grandma's house. Yeah. Sometimes you get eaten by the wolf if you don't do it right. You can put a two in there, that's a contour interval. After you get the first one, you can do a two times 37 over nine. 
comes up with your constant of eight feet. And then you can move over and go eight, 16, 24. And again, the next one goes right through. So this is uh, 56, 54, this is 52. And congratulations, you've now interpolated your very first line in your life. <coughs> and you get your contour line. But we're not done, we have to do the other ones. So if I do this one between 59 and 57, this is an easy one because 58 happens to be a x square in the middle. I can do the math. 59 minus 57 is 2. 2 divided by this thing, I'm looking for the next contour down 58. I can literally just cheat or the numbers will make half of what this is. So I got about 47 divided by 2. So half of that distance, literally about 23, 24 feet. is about half, and that is then contour 58, 758. I can do the other one. Now notice there's no 58 in this line. I'm, I'm only going between 50 and 57. So again, I can sort of cheat a little bit, or I can take a shortcut is probably a better way to phrase that. But I've got 7 divided by 45. And I'm using the two-foot contours. And if I were to do the math and take the time to do it, and I've done this a million times, I can actually do this pretty quickly with a constant. Okay. As soon as you're good at skating forward, I don't recommend you turn around and try to skate backwards with the hurt. This is the correct process to interpolate. You can go slow, you can sometimes get a break, and you can go quicker, you can take a shortcut. If you really know what you're doing and you get particularly great at this, you can even shortcut it further. But somehow you're gonna have all of these little tick marks all over the place. And we've interpolated one tin surface, one tin face, that's it. We would continue this process then, and I'm just going to rough these out because I just kind of, I don't know if it's time for it too much. But 41 to 42, 44, 46, 48. And going this way is a bunch of them. So 42, 44, 46. 48, 50, 52, 54, 56. Now, I didn't do that correctly. I just guessed at this point. This is the process mathematically. But when you're done, you get all these little contours and these tick marks. That looked like this. <clears throat> so I did this one correctly and took my time and did all this math and all that stuff. That's what I'd like to have you do. Again, sometimes you can get and shortchange it, sometimes you can, but when you're done, when you've done it correctly, you will have all of your little triangles with all of these little tick marks and interpolations. And you can just kind of cast an eye on them and see if it makes sense. 41, let's see, 42, 4, 46, 48, 50, 52, 54, 56. These should be very uniform. Mine's not because I just put them in there. Okay, but they should be very uniform coming up through there. Be pretty uniform going up through there. Now, last thing is to draw the contours. So now on step four is the last step is to draw contours. And literally all you're doing is connecting dots. You can start anywhere you kind of anywhere you want. I'm going to start here at, uh, actually I'm going to start right in the middle of this 52. Okay, kind of start anywhere, but you'll start to see the pattern. 
Now, technically, since this is a flat planar surface, everything is nice and flat and planar. Technically, these are straight edges. 52. And you always work across the triangle. Don't try to guesstimate where you think it wants to go. You just look at the triangle. There's a 52. There's a 52. Draw it. Here's a 52. Here's a 52. Draw it. Somewhere in here is going to be, uh, I see 52 is going to be in this range. So 52 would be down here. You would simply draw it. So these are your contours. At least these are your DEM models. So 54 to 54. I'm just going to kind of put it in light. 54. Now 54 is at A. So that's the point, and this is interesting. All right, so 54 is at A. 54 crosses here. That is my triangle point. So I would go from here right to A because that's the elevation. That's, that's the 54. I'm going to do, what's next, 56. 56 comes here. It's going to cut across. Now, 58, here it is. On this side, 58 now goes here to here. I don't know what it does after that. I got an idea, but I don't know. So the best you can do is stay within the perimeter of your point. That's all you can do. So eventually, 48. 42, 42. All right, so... When you're done, you get these straight lines, and that is a true model. Problem is, nothing was jagged over there. Ground roll, everything was nice and rolly and holy. Good. So our model, the best we could do with our model is I had a point here, a point here, and a point here. Or a point here, there, and there. The best this modeling can do, the best computer in the world, the best it can figure, is to assume that those are three planar points, and it makes the model. It does now use, this is the only time it uses a calculus kind of an idea. It knows, or we know, I guess, not it, but we know that this ground really is not shaven, jaggedy edged going across there. So... You get into math, higher mathematics, they call this a spline fit. And literally, if I were to take on, like on the 54s, this is a good analogy here. If I were to take that 54 contour and hit the points at 54 up here, the middle one, this one, and this one, if I were to take that, then I can mathematically manipulate like an equation between there. And make this fit. And the way that it does this is it's like a kind of like what I was doing with that ruler. I wanted to use that. It kind of takes where the next one is and it sort of holds it going in that direction. What do they call that? The um, the concave and the convex numbers of it. It takes that slope. It begins to it begins to adjust that based upon where the next slope, what the next one is. So like on this one, it's going to probably bow it out a little bit because it's going this way. And then this one is going to bow it the other way. Okay. So it starts to take into that bow effect. It's called a spline fit. And I'm going to draw it on the next page because that one seems pretty messy. So um, 54 might look like this is a model. <clears throat> and it's going to hold the points. The points were given. I can't change the data point. Okay. But it'll, it'll try to look at the next one to see where it's going. But what it'll do is it'll take that and it'll begin to bow this thing out. And they call this smoothing. Actually, it'll probably come this way a little bit. It's called this smoothing. And that's a little bit of an art, or it's a spline fit. There's, there's computations. Again, there's a lot more to this story than I'm telling you. Um, but what it'll do is it'll sort of smooth that out. It'll sort of round it out, because we know that it's not jaggedy yet straight. And it'll give it a true contour. And these are the ones, then, that become published. Or they get used 
as the contour line. So that's where the contour lines come from on this kind of a process. What do I want you to know? Okay. I want you to be able to do everything we just did today. I want you to be able to calculate elevation at every point. I want you to take your notes for the shots that you did over there, the angle, the distance, the vertical, where you get your elevation. Okay. And then I want you to be able to take a protractor and a scale And again, I, would, I want one inch equals 20. I like 20. And I want you to plot those 10, 15 shots, 20 shots, whatever, uh, whatever you can get on the paper. Now, if you got one that falls way off the paper, I don't care. Tape it on there or whatever you want to do. But mostly the, uh, this area. I want you to be able to plot points. I want you to label up the points with the elevation and the description. And then I would like you to be able to draw contours using this interpolation process. The plotting is pretty simple, kind of intuitive. This is new to you. So you say, George, I didn't understand everything you did there. Well, there's the manual, there's the book, there's YouTube videos, there's 40,000 things. Uh, but it's called interpolation of contours. Okay. I wouldn't get too crazy looking and watching somebody else do it. It's like watching a hockey game. I could watch a million hockey games and they skate fantastic. You're going to learn more about how to skate by putting them on your feet and going out there and trying. So you can watch a little bit and kind of get the gist of it. But by and large, you probably should just kind of work your way through that. And again, I, this thing's live on YouTube, so you'll be able to watch me do what I just did here today again anytime you want and be able to interpolate. So for the project, I always get this as a problem. We can talk about it more next week. But we're ready, to, you know, we're starting to turn the corner. We're going to start getting stuff together to turn in. For the project, I would like you to take your 10, 15, 20 points, plot them out, and generate the contours. I would prefer manually. In fact, if you want to plot them in AutoCAD, I have to show you that next week. That's okay. That saves you this and this. But I would like you to manually just interpolate and put them in. Okay. I'm not looking for, when I grade them, I'm not looking for high degree of precision. I, I understand you're using a pencil and a piece of paper. Or okay. But I would like you to understand the process. You need to at least know why and what a contour, how a contour is generated. Because, of course, it's done on a computer anymore. This process takes a nanosecond to do a 10,000 points, like boom, but this is the process a computer uses. It takes the shots, it takes the measurements, it takes the elevation at each point, it generates a 10, it, um, you put in the contour interval, it does the interpolations, it draws the contours, it smooths them out that quick, and you can't see it. You don't, what the heck is it doing? It's like magically appearing. No, there's a lot of crap that's on. So I want you to understand what it's doing. Once you get it once, you don't have to do it the rest of your life. But you need to get it once. So, today, it is not going to rain. Almost didn't rain yesterday. It almost rained yesterday. Today's going to be a great day. It's going to be a beautiful day. Thursday is another fantastic weather day. Thursday is going to meet me at Burnett at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon over there at Burnett. We're going to take about 20 shots. By the way, if any other group needs to turn an angle, um, you know, this is a good time to figure that out. You can also come over there and meet us if you need to. All right. I, I think that the smaller group today will have an extra piece of equipment. If you're not going to see me until next week, have a good, safe, smart weekend. Uh, I'm stupid. Can you get out the door before he does something? You have a contractor. Yeah.